Folks, is there a more highly politicized medication in the United States? Yes. Yes, there is. But today, of course, we will be talking about Kratom. This plant from Southeast Asia, it has sparked a lot of debate, a lot of controversy, and a lot of really good conversation in the comments of some of my videos. Brief overview is there's this plant in Southeast Asia that people chew up and swallow, and it actually interacts with some human receptors, particularly the mu opioid receptor. But Kratom has such a very weird connotation to it because you can just buy it. It doesn't need a prescription or anything. I don't really know why. It seems like uh, government agencies hate this, yet it's still allowed to be sold for the most part across the United States. But is it dangerous? Is it a cure or a killer? I'm Grant Harding, a licensed pharmacist in three states. Today, we'll be talking more about Kratom. What actually is Kratom? Well, there's about 25 different active chemicals inside these leaves, but the most important, the most uh, widely studied, and the most active, from what I can tell, is mitragynine, or mitragynine, depending on who you ask, and a very similar chemical, 7-hydroxymitragynine, or mitragynine. I'm going to call it mitragynine for the rest of this video, because I think that sounds cool. There's a lot of debate around these chemicals, and this, from what I can tell, is the general consensus. There are a lot of people who think that it's good. It can help with substance use disorder, especially those that interact with mu opioid receptors, so like opioids, for example. Why? Because you don't have to go to a doctor. Going to a doctor is expensive. It's difficult for a lot of people, too. And although these plants are pretty expensive to begin with, it's probably a better financial decision, strictly speaking strictly in terms of money, than it is to go to a doctor, get a prescription, have it filled, fight with your insurance. If they pay for it, maybe they won't. And it creates a lot of access to this leaf. The bad general consensus, it's super addicting. Very, very habit-forming, causes horrible withdrawal. People have lost their lives to it, although we will talk more about that here in a moment. And the medium parts of this debate. Uh, a lot of people say it depends on the source you get it from, you know, different or higher qualities. And there's a lot of inconsistency between these opinions. Um, people feel very strongly about this, uh, either one end of the spectrum or the other. However, I was exposed to some new information, especially as it pertains to death related to kratom use. The CDC claims that between 2016 and 2017, there were 91 deaths due to Kratom, but this claim should be greeted with skepticism as all but seven of these casualties had other drugs in their system at the time of death, making it impossible to uniquely impli implicate Kratom. This is incredibly important. A mu opioid agonist that doesn't cause death, respiratory depression, oh my goodness, like, this is what medicine has been wanting for decades. The reason being, and we'll get into the structure here in a little bit, is because these active ingredients, particularly the 7 hydroxy has different affinity for kappa opioid receptors than what I'll call traditional opioids like uh, morphine and codeine, and etc. Additionally, there are different subtypes of the mu opioid receptor, and different affinities to these subtypes may create less of a respiratory depression effect. Take a look at this image, folks. This molecule at the top is morphine, although I do not like how the artist depicted this. Um, the nitrogen atom at the top does not have three hydrogens bounded to it in morphine. Or, yeah, in morphine. Uh, but I don't think that's really what they were trying to dictate here. It just kind of looks like it. Anyway, there's important parts of this molecule. Number one is the nitrogen I just mes uh, mentioned a tertiary nitrogen binding site. Now what happens is these chemicals and all chemicals that interact with receptors pretty much, they, they float around in your body and then whenever they come in contact with the receptor, it kind of snaps together like a magnet. And this is exactly what's happening here. This nitrogen atom on the morphine is snapping to an amino acid on this enzyme called the mu opioid receptor. Additionally, you can see here the fat phenolic binding site. That's ubiquitous in medicinal chemistry. There's nothing special about that, but you have to have that there for these receptors to become activated. It also talks about this anionic binding site here with the oxygen atom. Not really that relevant. We'll, we'll, you'll see here soon. The most important part is the nitrogen. Now, this next image is pretty difficult to understand. It's a lot going on here, but you can see this protonated amine on the morphine molecule is 
interacting with the ASPAR-147 from the mu opioid receptor. This reminds me of the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel. You have Adam listily, lazily reaching out towards God the Father Almighty with a half-bent finger. And God, you can see on the other side of the image, is stretching out as hard as he can to break, to make contact with man. And there's hardly any effort at all. And it's our faith that ties in, that, that fills in that negative space and creates that bond. And that's exactly what's happening here in this molecule. Additionally, the oxygens of the phenol, hydroxy, and ether groups are oriented towards the extracellular side. And the phenolic rings, uh, they, they form weak hydrophobic bonds. Uh, so they have to be there. For those of you who don't know, your DNA codes for RNA, and then the RNA is code, codes for proteins. So these amino acids, uh, your body takes them and puts them into a pile, basically. And it does it in such a way that they, they form a perfect little pattern that has these little amino acids sticking out everywhere, sticking in everywhere. And whenever it comes into a contact with a molecule that it likes, it'll, it'll do something. The, the charge of the molecule and the charge of the enzyme react with each other. It fits together like a magnet. And sometimes that creases, creates a change in the body. Sometimes it does nothing. Uh, but what's really cool is that we can look at these enzymes, these receptors, know which proteins and which or which amino acids make up the protein and we can pretty much figure out you know which chemicals will snap in there and which chemicals will be uh, agonists at this receptor and that's exactly what we did here with 7-hydroxymetragenine take a look or this is actually metragenine but the point still remains do we have a protonated amine yes we do right here so this will interact with that aspart 147 on the mu opioid receptor. Aspart is an amino acid, by the way. Are there phenol rings that can form the hydrophobic bonds? Yeah, there's four of them there. I'm not really sure which ones are the important ones, but there's enough grease. <laughs> they call it, it's, it's lipophilic. It's kind of like fat, kind of. Not really, but anyway. Uh, there's enough there to satisfy that requirement. And then, of course, the oxygens that point outside uh, of the enzyme. I mean, there's a quite a few there. I'm assuming these three are the ones that do that, although I can tell you that's not quite nearly as important as the amine. So what our genius medicinal chemists do, and they really are genius, I don't think there's anything more important than a good medicinal chemist, as they will look at these molecules, they will figure out what they can tweak, what we can change a little bit here, a little bit there, to get a little bit more kappa uh, receptor activation, a little less mu, I don't know, two or three subtype. I don't know which ones they are off the top of my head. And they will do this in such a way to create a molecule that hopefully is safe and effective. It's really amazing. Two things I noticed from uh, talking to folks about this kratom plant. Uh, one, people get really, really passionate about their anecdotal personal experience with chemicals. And rightfully so. I felt this myself. I mean, you're literally putting something in your body that's being taken up by your cells, interacting with your receptors. Like, you do feel a little bit of a bond to it, and you get a little bit offended whenever folks uh, try to correct you. Like, I, I know this. I've, I've taken this. I've felt this. I've seen this also in the bodybuilding community. The, um, the folks who abuse anabolic steroids, they, think, they know everything. You can't tell them nothing. People get very prideful. That's what I'm trying to say. And I felt this too, you know, I've, I'm very much a methadone expert. I love methadone. I think it's one of the best medicines in the world, especially for cancer-related pain. And one time somebody told me something was just flat out wrong about it. And I felt the urge to like argue with them. But of course I didn't, you know, pride and everything. I tried to avoid the temptations of pride. I just kind of let them think whatever they wanted to think. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is there is a special connection I think people do feel sometimes. However... General consensus, this is a very, very dangerous plant. Very, very dangerous chemical. Most people would say that. And I mean like 80% of people who have any experience with this or uh, family members. I got a lot of emails about people who had family members who had really, really bad experiences with this. And, uh, you know, some of them unfortunately passed. But so most people would say that this is incredibly dangerous. 
but we have medicinal chemists. Maybe we can take this molecule and make it something more helpful.